Unfortunately, I do not. <sighs> Welcome to the regularly scheduled finance meeting for Monday, December 19th. Madam Clerk, item number one, please. Order. The Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs is offering reimbursable grants to cities and towns to support the preservation and restoration of urban parks through the Parkland Acquisitions and Renovations for Communities Park Grant Program, 301 CMR 5.00. And the City of Brockton is eligible for $400,000 in park grant funding, and the Brockton Redevelopment Authority has allocated $120,000 in community <coughs> development block grant funds, Walker Playground. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, Rob May, Director of Planning and Economic and Development, Rob Jenkins, Executive Director of the Brockton Redevelopment Authority. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Merry Christmas, Councilors. Merry Christmas. Good Happy holidays. Councilor Rezac, Thank I you, Mr. You Chairman. This. Good evening, Mayor. Um, before we go on with some of the questions, I'd like to welcome some of my Ward 7 constituents who are sitting over here in the audience, so welcome. And um, I'd like to make an amendment to the um, order just, um, and I believe we're all on, I've spoken to the mayor about this and uh, some, uh, and Mr. May and a few of my uh, colleagues. And I would like to make an amendment uh, to, the, uh, to the order that there will be no adult sized soccer field at Walker's playground. Second. I have a motion made and seconded to amend the order. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilor, while we're voting on this, could you write that out sure. please? Uh, so uh, after number three will be number four that the, uh, there be no full-size soccer adult soccer field at Walker Playground. Uh, on the <laughs> uh, questions on the amendment, all those in favor? The amendment can... carries. Uh, to the resolve, that, that amendment is to the resolve. Okay. Uh, Mr. President, I could offer some clarification perhaps as could. to how we got where we are. So at the time that this grant application was submitted, first of all, it is great news that the state is giving us a maximum award of $400,000 on this grant. And this will enable about a half a million dollars worth of work on one of our uh, city playgrounds without expending one cent of local Brockton funds. Uh, $400,000 from the state, $120,000 in matching CDBG funds that have already been allocated in the current year's budget. Money's already set aside. Part of this application process involved uh, community meetings and community input. And we did have a community meeting uh, at the Raymond School. There was ongoing communication after that. Particularly, I have had numerous conversations with the, with the Ward 7 Council on behalf of her constituents. The centerpiece of this proposal is a full-size regulation soccer field. Um, the neighborhood made it very clear that they don't want a full-size soccer field uh, at that location. So, I mean, that's why we do community input and, and community hearing, and I don't think any of us wants to force something down the throat of a neighborhood that doesn't want it. Uh, we've been in a little bit of limbo waiting to hear if the grant would be awarded or not, because the deadline for filing was very shortly after that meeting. Um, during the time that the state is considering and selecting which grants will be awarded, the communication ceases. There's no back and forth communication during the deliberation period by the state before they announced the awards. The awards were just announced last week, uh, so there hasn't been a lot of time, and there's a deadline of December 31st. If we don't formally accept the grant before December 31st, we lose it, and the money goes back to the state. So it is imperative that we accept the grant but also want to uh, take into account uh, the feelings of the folks who live nearby. And we're looking to balance that against what I believe is a very uh, overwhelming need for more soccer fields in the city. The, the demand far outweighs the supply right now. Uh, so the good news with this grant is that it's a two-year grant. So 2017 is strictly just a planning year. So plan and design and community input all during 2017. And then once we get the final go ahead from the state after we go through that process, 2018 would be the construction year. So we have taken a half a step back on this, uh, working uh, with Tim Carpenter and Rob May and Robert Jenkins. We've agreed to look at three or four other city parks as perhaps being 
locations that would have more neighborhood support than this one does. Because I think what we're really trying to do here is accomplish a goal of getting a nice investment in one of our playgrounds, building a much needed soccer field, but also doing something with the support of the neighborhood uh, that's in the immediate area. So this one year for plan allows plenty of time for us to vet out, we think there's at least three or four other parks that are potential locations. We can vet them out, put together alternative proposals, work with the folks at the state, and the grant will require additional community meetings. So wherever we ultimately all agree is a good place to go with it, then we'll have neighborhood meetings and community meetings for that location, just as we did for this one, and there'll be plenty of opportunity for, for input. So. I do still believe that there is a critical need uh, for a regulation size soccer field in the city. Um, I think one of the other things we learned from the input from the neighborhood at Walker's is that they would really like to preserve baseball there. Uh, that particular playground has a very <coughs> hitch, rich, excuse me, rich history in, play, uh, in uh, baseball and softball. And it is a very underutilized park right now since Pony and Colt League stopped playing three or four years ago. Um, there's a Sunday softball league, there's a little bit of flag football, but it is a very underutilized um, playground right now. So I think that we're already having some conversations in terms to see what we might be able to do to attract some more baseball to that location so that we could justify uh, baseball continuing to be the primary uh, use of that field. Also, I think a real benefit that's come out of this, uh, working with the residents and the neighbors, is some real concerns have been expressed uh, by people in the neighborhood around uh, illegal activity taking place in the vicinity of the playground. And I think that that's brought some real attention to that. And you know, we've pledged, we've already spoken with the chief, and we've pledged that working with the ward counselor to come out and continue to work with the neighborhood on resolutions. We've already taken some initial steps. We've added a floodlight. Uh, we've added some patrols. But clearly, there's more work to be done. Um, and we want to work closely with the neighborhood in addressing uh, those issues, which really we want to address in every single neighborhood in the city, whether they happen to have a playground as a neighbor or not. But clearly, sometimes, because of the nature of playgrounds, they can be uh, an attraction for illegal activity. And uh, we want to put an end to that because the green spaces and the open spaces belong to the good people of the city, <coughs> not to drug dealers. Can you also Council for now? Yes, thank you. Council thank you. Barnes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I just have a question about the, um, the actual application. So <coughs> I, I know uh, previously there were uh, some conversations, like you said, about this possibly being renovated and being converted to um, a soccer field designated solely for that at one time. The conceptual drawing actually included more than just that, but certainly the soccer <coughs> field was the centerpiece. Was the center, right. So was that included in the actual application? Is, is any of this predicated we have on been, that yes, happening? Yes. So uh, there had to be a conceptual drawing in the um, the filing deadline was literally, I forget what it was, three days after we had the community meeting or something. So we actually took a lot of good suggestions, uh, one of which I'd like to follow through on regardless, and that's removing a parking lot at the end of May Ave that's part of the, the Walker Playground, that that has seemed to be a, a magnet for some activity that we don't like. Um, and I think that regardless, we want to move forward with a plan to get rid of that small <laughs> parking area. Um, but the, the planning had only gone up to the point of a conceptual drawing. The intent was to take a lot of the input from that community meeting, and when we went into the design year during this upcoming year, to incorporate suggestions from the neighborhood. Uh, but there was no getting away from the fact that there was strong sentiment a among a lot of the residents in the neighborhood that just didn't want the soccer field. Okay. And so I think that's why we're taking half a step back and we're asking the council's consideration to accept the grant so that we don't lose the $400,000, but with the clear understanding that we're going to spend the plan year getting a location that has uh, more neighborhood support. And in the highly unlikely event that we were not able to move it, uh, Councilor Asak's suggestion that I have no objection to is that she wanted to put an amendment on uh, 
uh, condition, I guess, by amendment uh, on the acceptance of the grant that the funds would not be used to build a regulation size field at Walker's. We've already given our word on that, so I have no problem with that whatsoever. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Councilor Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, I do agree that the city does, necess does very much need uh, more regulation size field. And I do agree with the residents that that site was not the most appropriate site for a, for a full-fledged soccer complex in the sense. And I'm glad that at least you've had the meetings with the uh, residents and we're in the process of looking elsewhere to do that. But I, as far as um, you know, something that we probably need to look into, there are plenty of soccer fields in this community. What we don't have is a great deal of usable soccer fields. So has there been some thought about perhaps going after some real money to invest on some synthetic fields, you know, artificial turfs, so that we can actually hold, because I can just think of the um, pick field not too far away from right. here, but those fields get used and used and used to a point where there's nothing left but right. dearth. But if we basically were able to put some sort of a synthetic field on these particular fields, we can kind of quadruple the number of games we can hold in these facilities and thus not necessarily going out, um, overtaking something else that exists in the, in the city already to accommodate the need for soccer. So uh, I think you know, the idea should actually be to leverage these funds that we're getting, seek out additional funds, do whatever we need to do, but let's, let's go out and borrow if we need to borrow, do something that we need to do to invest on these fields uh, so that they're usable fields. You know, it's, sometimes it's embarrassing when you travel around the Commonwealth and you see facilities throughout the Commonwealth that are beautiful facilities that people are using on a regular basis. And we've got a ton of people in this community uh, who are diehard soccer players, diehard soccer fans that are, you know, want to go to a nice facility to watch uh, uh, a game or participate in a game. But to be honest with you, it becomes very dangerous because those fields are not in a condition that they should be in. So I would actually would go for a little further and recommend that instead of just even looking at the possibility of putting a, a youth size soccer field at Walker's to basically forget about soccer at Walker's and look into one, leveraging these funds to get additional funds and to focus on putting some artificial turf in some of these fields. Yeah, so if I could respond, Councillor, um, I agree with everything you said. This particular grant opportunity specifically excluded the use of artificial turf. So that wasn't even on the table for this grant opportunity. It's a parks grant and it requires that we have to have natural grass. So I agree with the need. This was the grant opportunity that was in front of us right now that we had an opportunity to go after. And we have a lot of needs. Uh, you know, I think the tough budgets of the last 15 or 20 years have really caused the parks and playgrounds to be shortchanged quite often because it's just natural that, you know, when we've got a tight budget and it's police and it's fire and it's ball fields, ball fields are going to come in third every time. So this was an opportunity to get a significant grant from the state, but it is a pox grant. It has a number of conditions on it. One of it is that the site does have to be a designated park. It can't just be any old piece of land that the city owns. It's got to be a designated park area. And it did specify that we could not use synthetic turf. The idea of this is to, there's a conservation angle to this, or a recreating green spaces and cities angle to this. And, uh, you know, I think there'll be some other things besides just the soccer field. So I agree with you. We've been talking about an artificial turf soccer field since day one. It's a matter of finding the money. Yeah, because when you sit down and think about it, I mean, the, the state needs to rethink its position here because uh, we, know, we all know what happened during the year last year in terms of the, the rains and the, the lack of rain that we actually had. Why would they be pushing for a, a uh, so-called natural soccer field or natural, natu uh, natural fields when we're going to run into the watering issues that we run into on a regular basis, before you know it, it will become a dirt field again. Like I think the else. issue that you pointed out, Councilor, is the, is the very real one for us, and it's the overuse, the heavy use of the field. Um, one of those fields at Pick Park, we have 
rebuilt that field two years in a row now, <clears throat> and it's great for the first couple months of the season. And then when midsummer comes and the, we get into the drought conditions and everybody's playing on it, it takes a beating, and we end up having to try to bring it back again for the following season. So uh, there is no doubt that we have a pressing need um, for an artificial turf field that I would love to see multi-purpose, not necessarily just soccer, but football and soccer and lacrosse and whatever else we want to play on it, but a, a multi-purpose artificial turf field in the city. That's a long-term goal that we're still working towards. In the meantime, this grant opportunity presented itself, and we're very excited that we received a maximum grant award. No, I, I, I don't want you to get me wrong. I mean, I do support the, the grant. All I'm saying is that I yeah, think... Yeah, you want an artificial turf field. No, I'm just saying I think we need to, you know, instead of, buy, instead of doing these patchworks that we tend to do, I mean, I, I remember when I worked with Harrington, we fixed that field at Pickfield. You know, spent a ton of money redoing the dirt and doing all that other stuff. So, it, it, so it's been done several times. Absolutely. But it seems like we keep putting Band-Aid at the problem instead of going out and borrowing money if we have to, build a nice facility because I understand that we are talking about where our priorities are in terms of public safety and with fire and police and all that other stuff. But when you sit down and think about it, if we can keep the youth in this community busy doing some real uh, activities, uh, gainful activities in the sense, I think it, out, it actually goes a long way towards public safety as well. I think every time you say borrow money, Jay gets a chill up it's and down right. his spine. You know what? He, yeah. he borrows for all kinds of stuff, so what's wrong with borrowing for some old stuff? We're in agreement, Counselor. We're, I, I, think, I think we're all trying to work in the same direction. I think that you're right about that, the, the fields at pick, and I think part of that is the reason it receives so much play is because there is so much demand for field time. This is, I think that's a symptom of the fact that we need more capacity. But you know, getting back to this grant, um, listening to the neighbors, uh, I, I think that it makes more sense for us to seek another park uh, for this particular project. But we will continue to work with the neighbors on concerns around public safety. And we will work with the neighbors around trying to get baseball more reestablished there so we can justify its continuing use as a baseball field. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Motion? Motion um, to, to approve, to accept. But on, on the motion, um, I'd like to act on this this evening. So can we do that right after the, the vote? We can't act. We can't accept till next Monday night. Next Monday, okay. It so I go to full council. So, so I motion sent to full um, council. Um, As amended councilor? Yes. Oh, with the amendment, yes. Uh, second. Motion made and seconded to recommend to the full council as amended. All those in favor? All those opposed? Recommended favorably. Thank you very much, Thank counselors. you very much, Your Honor. Thank you, councilor. Item number said. two. Order that the naming of Came Street also be, be known as McAllister Way invited Tony Branch, Chairman of the Diversity Commission. Good evening, Mr. Branch. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and uh, City Council members. Merry Christmas and Happy Hanukkah. And Merry to Christmas. you too. I have something, may I read this into the, I just have a statement to read into the record. Sure. On July 26th of this year, our city lost a son a family lost a father. Wayne McAllister was an honorably discharged member of the United States Army who went on to serve the Brockton community as a firefighter, excuse me, as a firefighter, taking another oath that placed his life on the line for the community in which he loved our city. Mr. McAllister's compassion and commitment to service continued by his election as the vice president of the Brockton Fire Department Local Union 144. But it doesn't stop there. Concerned about our city's public safety, Wayne served on the Mayor's Crime and Drug Task Force. Concerned about equality and justice, Wayne served as a member of the Brockton NAACP. Concerned about our future, concerned about the future of our city, Wayne served as a commissioner on the planning board, serving as his chairperson. And concerned about education, Wayne ran and was elected to the Southern, Southeastern Regional School Committee, serving in that capacity until his death. Representative Wayne McAllister was the first African-American elected to public office in Brockton 
As a Democratic delegate, Wayne served Plymouth and Bristol County <coughs> with great distinction. On behalf of the, every citizen of the city, I seek your approval in renaming his street of residence to Wayne McAllister Way, an honor bestowed on him and his family for his unselfish service to our city. His demeanor that never sought recognition, a humble servant he was, he's an example to all of us in terms of lifetime commitment to community service. I thank Sharon, his wife, and his wonderful children, and his siblings for allowing us to have him as our treasure. So basically what we're seeking is to name um, his street after him in recognition of his lifetime of service to the city of Brockton. In addition to that, Mark Lindy was to join me this evening, but he had a library board meeting. He's also supporting this. I'm sorry for my scratchy voice. I have a bad cold. Thank you. <coughs> Council Stanisky, I believe you filed this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, it is my pleasure to be the person who filed this. Uh, Mr. Branch gave me a call, but prior to him, I want to recognize Mr. Jacob Tagger. He had tried to get in touch with me, and we just didn't hook up. But I heard that uh, there was work being done on this, and we couldn't honor a finer gentleman, That's true. man, family mm -hmm. in the city than Wayne E. McAllister. And uh, I will be asking for an amendment to it so that this King Street will also be, also be known as Wayne E. McAllister Way. Thank you. I want to thank you, Mr. Branch, and the, and the commission. Thank Very you, uh, Councilor Sadinsky, for your support. Councilor Barnes. I just had, a, I guess, a procedural question. So um, is this going to be like uh, the way Day, Day Ave, I think it is, uh, Charlie Tataglia and Day, it's going to look like that with the dual signs? That was what was asked of, yes. Okay, and this will be a permanent sign on the street, correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. Any other questions, Councilors? So you first would like to make an amendment to make sure we make the this. amendment to read <clears throat> that, that this particular came street also shall be known as Wayne E. McAllister Way. Second. 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 The motion made and seconded to uh, amend the uh, order. All those in favor? All those opposed? The order is amended and now entertain a motion. Motion for a favorable uh, finding sent back to the full city council. Second. 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 Motion made and seconded to send back to the full city council favorably as amended. All those in favor? All those opposed, recommended favorably. Uh, that may not be on our next meeting because this also had to go to the planning board. Okay. So it may come up uh, after the first of the year. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, God bless you all. Thank, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Item number three. Mm -hmm. Order that the City Council authorize the acceptance of the Mass General Law Chapter 60, Section 3A, form of bill or notice, electronic format, which would permit the city to provide the option for taxpayers to receive their bills electronically and would govern how the city implements this option. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Conan, Chief Financial Officer, John O'Donnell, Chairman of Assessors, Larry Riley, DPW Commissioner, Martin Brophy, Tax Treasurer Collector. Good evening, Mr. Brophy. Good evening, Councilors. You want to fill us in a little on this? Well, I asked for this chapter and section be accepted so that we, we basically we can't send an electronic bill without the acceptance of council okay. and it's a voluntary program so if someone doesn't want to receive the piece of paper we can send it to them in electronic format. Mm -hmm. okay. Council Stanisky I believe you filed this. I did uh, Mr. Chairman uh, uh, being the only non checking on the council. <laughs> <laughs> I felt it was important to file this, <laughs> yeah. uh, but I, I am in favor of it. Uh, in particular, the fact it says that the option for the taxpayers to receive it one way or the other. Mm -hmm. I think that's an important option. Yeah. Councilor Rezac. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Um, how are we going to let the residents know that this is going to be available to them? We could actually, uh, I mean, we'll post it on the website. Um, we're actually uh, looking to upgrade the way bills can be paid through the website, and it will be an option right there as well. As they're paying it online, they can ask, they can sign up for either both paper and electronic, or strictly electronic, mm -hmm. or they can leave it just to paper. Okay. Is it still, it's still going through a third party though? Th through yes. Okay. And the other question. Uh, it, is it going to be at the bottom of our, like the bills? Will it say you have, will it give them the option to? We have the option of actually, you know, the website to pay the website online. So we certainly can say, <coughs> if you wish to receive this, we'll put a note, a message. So there will be a note yep. inside the yep. next bills. Okay, yep. thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Barnes. That line of questioning actually just um, spurred something else. So if people have the option now, or they will have the option now to pay online, will there be like a service fee, like Ticketmaster there has, has like been. a $3, it, 350 fee or whatever? There has all along. It's a, it's a 50 cent Lord. for an e-check, and currently it's, I think, 3%. Correct. For, yep. So it'll be 3% or $3? Um, I think it's a minimum of a dollar, um, and then a 3%. That on. Kelly Ryan, is that the, or is it another third? No, we're actually, right now we're online with through Munis. Okay. Um, and we have official payments corp that handles credit cards. Okay. But they still have the option to come in and pay as well. Oh, they absolutely. Have to. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. you, Council. Any other questions? Recommendation? Motion to approve. Second. second. Motion made and seconded to send to the full city council favorably. All those in favor? All those opposed? Recommended favorably. Thank you yeah. very much. Have a good Christmas, Mr. Brophy. Item number four. Order that the mayor be and is hereby authorized to transfer ownership of the city-owned parcel at 19 Main Street, commonly known as the First Parish Building, Map 092, Route 014, Plot 127, that was previously declared by the City Council to be surplus and available for disposition to the Brockton Redevelopment Authority. Invited on were Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Conan, Chief Financial Officer, Phil Nesrella, City Solicitor, Robert... Robert Jenkins, Executive Director of the Brockton Redevelopment Authority. Uh, Council Monaghan, I believe you filed this? Yes. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, yeah. I'll bat lead off if you'd like me to. <laughs> Not really, but go ahead. Uh, just actually for the public at home and some of us, sure. 19, which building? So this is uh, 19 Main Street, which is the... Sealed Robinson Appliance Building. Okay, thank you. thank you. On the corner of Green Street. Corner of Main and Green. So there's a whole block. The right-hand half of the block was redeveloped many years ago by Yanni Davos as condos. This is the left-hand side of that block. Um, it's a long-term vacant building. It's one of the parcels that was identified in our urban renewal plan. Very ugly. Um, this particular property has... I can't give you the exact year, but I can tell you it's over 10 years since this property has paid any property taxes to the city. So I think it would be fair to call it a non-performing asset. Um, it, uh, the city has attempted twice uh, on its own to uh, market and sell the property uh, for private investment and redevelopment once in the administration prior to mine and once since I've been mayor in both cases. After extended periods of time, we were never able to get to the closing table with the prospective buyers for a variety of reasons. Um, but with us now having the urban redevelopment plan, it gives us this model of using the redevelopment ag agency, the Brockton Redevelopment Agency, uh, which is the, the commonly accepted model in most cities like uh, Brockton in Massachusetts. They use their redevelopment authority as a uh, conduit to uh, encourage private investment and in getting properties redeveloped. This particular property has historic significance, so it should have some attractiveness to uh, an investor that would seek historic tax credits. Um, it's still in okay condition, uh, but it is going to continue to deteriorate, and I think we've all shared a concern that we don't want to keep tearing down historic buildings if we don't have to. So I don't want to see it go the way of the Gardner or the Kresge. Mm -hmm. um, and so we ask, as this is our first step in uh, beginning to work with this uh, uh, urban redevelopment plan, uh, that uh, you authorize the transfer of this property over to the BRA for the purpose of putting it out for sale to a private <coughs> investor developer. Um, there was one other important point I wanted to make on this. Give me a second. And we've had it out a couple times before. We haven't closed on it. Uh, there was one other point I was going to make. It'll, it'll come to me when you start asking me questions. Questions? Councilor Farwell. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Just a couple of evening, background questions. Uh, we've owned this for some period of time. Is that right? The right of redemption has passed, and the city is the bona fide owner. Yes. Any idea what you think will be done with the property? And I'll... And I'll Obviously, because it's in the urban renewal area, whatever happens to that, you want it to 
augment right. what you have planned, but are we looking at housing? Are we looking at tearing the building down? Or? I, I think, no, I, I think we, I think we want to get this over to the BRA because we don't want to tear the building down. We want to get some private ownership in there to preserve it. Um, I think it's a, my personal opinion, I think it's a great candidate for this mixed use model where we would look to preserve the business district on the ground floor, some form of retail commercial. In my personal opinion, it could be a great site for a restaurant on the first floor. Um, I, I believe that, um, that the parking garage is coming and with the advent of a parking garage, it'll make this parcel along with several others in that neighborhood far more desirable. Uh, I know that it was at least a factor with the, um, with the exclusive negotiating period we had with the RFP, and thank you for reminding me. My other point, Council, was the City Council has already previously declared this property to be surplus. Mm -hmm. So the Council has, has done that previously. What we're looking now to do <coughs> is to send it over to the BRA so that they can oversee the redevelopment of the property. Um, so. In terms of what I believe would be a good use would be um, retail commercial on the ground floor. I think potentially a great site for a restaurant on the ground floor with either office or housing on the two floors above it. All right. if, if I'm correct, this is in the, the, uh, the overlay district for uh, housing? Am I? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Do you want to? So once, once that goes... I brought Robert Robert to help me with some of the technical questions. So if this were to go to the BRA, someone, a developer, as a matter of right, could come in and say, I'm going to make that housing, and if they pass all of the site review requirements, they could make that into just housing. I believe that, uh, and I won't speak for the BRA, but I believe that they would use an RFP process, which will allow them to work with the planning department in setting some parameters for what the potential future uh, development of the building would be. I, I think we all feel very strongly about maintaining the business district on the, on the first floor. And uh, one other point is, do we have any idea what you think it might be worth? Has anyone taken a look at the property and said, yeah. look, based on... The two times it is sold, it's sold, I think, for about 100000 the first time and about 130, 135000 the second time. So I think that's the range. Our concern certainly is that the longer it remains vacant, mm -hmm. that it, the building continues to deteriorate and it becomes less and less attractive to, a, uh, to an investor. The investor is going to put a lot more money into the building than they're going to pay to acquire it. Mm -hmm. All right, and my, my last point, and, uh, and you're probably worried about fiscal year 2018, like everyone else. If we turn this over to the BRA and it's sold, they will derive the proceeds. And we're sitting here in December, and you or I don't know what the level of state aid will be, Chapter 70 aid to the schools. We don't know what the level of unrestricted government aid will be. I mean, it's kind of a shot in the dark as to what fiscal year 18 will look like. <clears throat> and I guess if I had my preference, I, I'd sell the property and I'd, I'd put the money in an account maybe to be given to the BRA in the future, but until we really have a firm grasp on what <coughs> FY18 is going to look like, it just would seem to me that any assets we sell, we ought to retain in the general fund and, and, and have it available for general appropriation. So, Councillor, I certainly share your concerns about the upcoming FY18 budget. Um, I break out into cold sweats many nights thinking about it. The reality is we could sell this property today. It's of no use to us in the FY18 budget because the money would go back into free cash. It would then have to go into free cash for next year, get certified by the DOR, would not be available for us to use towards the budget to FY19. That's if we sell it today. I'm looking at a history of this building of twice, spending a year or two to never get to the closing table. So I agree, we could certainly use an extra 100, 150 grand for the budget this year. Th this asset isn't going to do that regardless, and I think if we start now balancing out what's $100,000 worth to us two years from now, if we get it sold in the next three or four months, three years from now, if we don't get it sold in the next uh, three or four months, then in that case, I think there's really a compelling argument to get it to the BRA, 
get it hopefully sold to the right developer with the right plan, with the right ability to redevelop it, and get it back on the tax rolls because that's the other piece here that's missing, right. and that is the longer we wait before we get new ownership and redevelop, the longer we wait to get it back on the tax roll. So I don't disagree with anything you said other than I just don't see a hundred grand <coughs> two or three years from now being a good enough reason to not move forward with this, you know, this very first step. And it's not like the money will be wasted. These first couple properties that we're able to sell in the, uh, in the urban uh, revitalization plan with the BRA, those are funds that are gonna prime the pump for the BRA to be able to continue, much like a revolving fund, to be able to continue to go after other properties to help us continue to, to revitalize the downtown. I think in that urban renewal district, we identified somewhere in the neighborhood of two dozen target properties. So there's a lot of work to be done, and this, the proceeds from the first couple can help prime the pump to give the BRA the ability to continue looking at some of those other problematic property so that we can do something with them. Well, I just, last comment, I hope that we don't end up selling it to a nonprofit and then it doesn't go in the tax rolls. And I also hope o that Over we, my dead body, Counselor. And then I also hope that we, we do get a, a substantial amount of money for it. I mean, it's right in the core area of, of the city and I would hate to see us part with it for less than its, its value. I, I think its value is certainly <clears throat> limited by the substantial amount of work it's going to need when the when the new uh, uh, owner comes in uh, but we certainly I'm sure the BRA will not be looking to leave any money on the table counselor thank you all, all your concerns are duly noted counselor thank you thank you, you Councilor uh, Monahan. Through, through you mr. chairman to my, my colleague council file I've been involved with this the last two uh, try trying to sell the let sell the last two times and I've been through that entire building. It does need a lot. There are, are a lot of historical things that could be done in there. There's some old woodwork, the ceiling, the glass ceiling, and what have you. It needs a lot of work. But I think the main thing is with the, with the RFP, that if the city's selling it, is that that RFP will determine whoever bids on it what actually will be done with that building. So they, have, they, can, they can turn away anyone they want. That's not, it's going to be all housing or whatever. That's not what it can be. So going through that RFP that with the city selling it, it can be what we want, what you want downtown. But as far as selling it, I mean, I think it was like 100 and 130,000 the first two times, and we just couldn't get anybody to really bite. We had one person to bite on it, and that, that ran out, they couldn't afford it, but I could, couldn't get the financing. But it does need a lot of work, so I'm, I'm hopeful that I go on this route, they'll be able to get somebody in there with the right, you know, historical credits and what have you, and can, and can get what we as a city want, like you want businesses downtown again so but it it does need a lot of work and uh, mm -hmm. it's been how many years now like six, six years worth of yeah, waiting easy. for this yeah. something to happen with that it, it goes back to the the first RFP and agreement was made under the prior administration right, right. I, I inherited it when it was on I think it's second extension when I came in right, mm -hmm. right. so thank so you had I would say the burden is on the mayor and council Monahan to get this done what's <laughs> 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 that council I'll say thank you Mr. Council Rodriguez uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Mayor, with all due respect to you, can I just ask uh, please, Mr. Please. Jenkins uh, a quick question? I don't think they can make a saga feel out of it. Uh, <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Jenkins. Good evening, Councilman. Uh, Mr. Jenkins, yes, uh, as the mayor stated, uh, this poor building has been sold a couple times, and I think it's getting tired of being sold. Well, it's been under agreement a couple of times. Never passed. I don't think it's ever passed. Well, sold without the money's coming this way. So you know what I mean. I do. Okay. So, uh, what process are you going to be use? Are you going to use in order to select the appropriate ownership so that this? So we're not sitting, not necessarily in this chamber, but in this in this particular process discussing this building two or three years from now. Sure. I think the, well, a couple of things. One is this is a, a model that's been used in every major city in Massachusetts. Lowell, Springfield, Worcester, Malden, Medford, New Bedford, even Fall River. Um, I'll probably, it's a matter of really negotiation and what's best for, the, best for the city. Council Winthrop, you bring up a really good point on what we want in the city. And in this particular building, I'm not sure if housing is really what we want. 
-hmm. um, in this particular building because one, there's no parking, even though we're getting the parking lot. But to get back to your question, the RFP process was used twice and it failed. Mm -hmm. So really we're looking to come up with an incentive, whether it's historic tax credits, whether it's TIF, it is in the urban renewal district. We do have, we really don't have to use the 30B process because it is in the urban renewal district, but it's really a negotiation on what we want. We'll come up with a criteria, and I think my board will definitely have its own criteria on what we should do with this particular building. As the mayor has pointed out, it does require a lot of work. Um, what we may get for it, Councilor, to answer your question, I don't think the building's worth 100,000, to be quite honest, in its current state. Um, and it's not gonna get better, especially if we're expecting the winter that we got two years ago. Uh, the roof is exposed. I don't know if the building department has went in and boarded it up or not. Um, but this building needs a lot of work. We're gonna probably look at maybe using an RFP, but definitely, Council, to come up with a criteria that we think best fits for the city, along with, if you've read the urban renewal plan or the blueprint for Brockton, you know what we have in mind. It has to be retail, commercial. We've been approached from people who are looking for back office space mm -hmm. that may work okay. with this, but we don't know yet. Yeah. We'll look and see. What's the best offer? What's the best use? I think it, to answer your question, we're still not, mm -hmm. I don't think we're set on whether or not we'll use an RFP. We'll come up with a criteria, whether it's back office space, commercial, definitely retail on the first floor. Uh, the parking lot is an advantage for this particular building mm -hmm. because there is no other parking other than off the street. So it'll have to play into the role with the garage, whatever we do. My question was not exactly with regards to what the use is going to be of the building. Our process. My was basically the process so we can find the appropriate person or the, Yet to be the appropriate determined. entity. Yet to be determined. To buy, to buy or to get, in, to get into this building so we're not going through this every, every couple years or so. Correct. That's that's what yet my, to be determined. That's what my concern was. Yet to be determined. And also one of the other, my other concern is the fact that, in quite a few of these opportunities, I've had local community investors, mm -hmm. individuals from the community, from the the city of Brockton, who are into this particular field, mm -hmm. that say that by the time they sense that these things are actually happening, that the process has already passed them by. So. What process are we going to use to ensure that local investors, because I, I, know, I know what you're thinking, but yeah, let, me just, I, let me just throw this back out at you. Sure. Because we sometimes tend to go outside of our own boundaries, mm -hmm. and these outsiders haven't really done much to help us, our community out in terms of these smaller projects. It happened at the corner of 21, uh, 121 Main. Yeah. We, we, we were here, and we discussed this. To nauseam. But, but I'm just saying that if we somehow, if we have local investors who are willing to invest and work locally, sure. you know, how are we going to make sure that, you know, that what I'm basically looking at is for us to really, once this process starts, whatever process that you're utilizing, mm -hmm. that it gets blanketed locally through a variety of ways so that local investors local contractors can actually get their paws on some of these properties and develop them yeah. based on what our needs are. Sure, and, I, and for those of you who do know me and those of you who don't, a lot of times the expertise that Council Rodriguez is talking about is right under our nose. Mm -hmm. um, we will, uh, one of the things we have planned and I know the mayor has planned for this spring is to a do a developer, not conference, but open house. Open house. Come and see, check out our wares, see what we have to offer here in Brockton. I think that's a good sense to find out. And as you said, we, we know that there are local contractors or builders who have the capacity to do a project like this. The door is open. As I said, the BRA and its board will determine what the criteria is, getting input also from the counselor. Council Winthrop is always in contact with my uh, chairman, Rod um, Gonzalez. You can come to one of our meetings as we discuss these projects, as, we, as they come up and we discuss them. Our meetings are open. You're always invited. Um, I think we'll, to answer your question, yes, the door will be open to local just as well as outside contractors. But how will they know? That's my, yeah. and it's if not it's, just the website. And here's, a, here's the thing. Usually the best way to know is word of mouth. Just like you know them, I know them, counselors here know them. 
believe me, at this meeting, local people know, mm -hmm. developers who have the capacity and been looking at this building, they're waiting in order for you to do what you do, which is to release some of this property in accordance with your, urban, your approved urban renewal plan by the council and the state. They've, the mayor said we have 24. We have 27 properties listed in the urban renewal plan that we've identified. There are people, contractors, local and out of state and non-local, who have seen that list. We would, they'll know. If not by word of mouth, we may advertise. There are some who will outreach too. Councilor, I know some that will outreach too just to get their input. But that's the best way to do it, Councilor. I'm not sure if I'm, if I'm answering your question to your no. acceptance, but. No, but what I'm saying is that. We won't put an ad in the paper. We won't put an ad in the paper. <laughs> we won't put an ad in the paper. But how, okay, so you're an investor, you're a, yeah. bit, uh, a, a contractor in this community. How would you know that you the go to the city is now opening. Two, th several ways. You can go to the city's website. You can go to the BRA's website. Um, you can look. I mean, how many yeah. urban renewal and buy um, the blueprint for Brockton website? You've come to community meetings. We've held them across the across the community. Yeah. Matter of fact, Rob, when's the next community meeting? We're having on housing and retail and open space Thursday. Is it this? It last Thursday. Last Thursday. I missed it. <laughs> I'm on vacation, mind you, but still, <laughs> it was last Thursday. But, Counselor, it, I mean, I won't put an ad in the paper. However, if you go to the website, you'll know. If you attend this meeting and this meeting is on the air, they know. Well, let me ask you a question. Is there any way you can notify us mm -hmm. so that we know when that process is taking place? Absolutely. So that, in that we will able, will we be able to communicate with some of the individuals in the community? Absolutely. Because it's happened several times on several occasions where somebody would come, out, would come in and say, oh, if I only knew that that building sold for X, Y, and Z, I would have invested in it. We get a lot of By the time they that. find out. You, but let me, you know me. Talk is usually very cheap. Everybody does it. It's not like this is a big secret. You approved it. The state approved it. It's on the website. It's on our website. We advertise then in, in the enterprise. Mm -hmm. It's out there. If you don't know, it's because you're not, you're not interested in, like I say, talk is cheap. But will you notify us so Absolutely. that we can notify them? That's all I'm saying. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Jenkins. Thank you, Mr. Thank Jenkins. you, Councillor. Councillor Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Mr. Jenkins. Good evening, Councillor. Happy holidays. Same to you, Thanks sir. Thanks for being here on your vacation. Not a problem, sir. <laughs> um, you know, I'm taking a hint from you. I remember you were on vacation and <laughs> came to the city council. <laughs> As you know, I, I, uh, I always get a little timid when the city has assets that it conveys over. I, I really wholeheartedly believe we, we, we were uh, misled on the Ganley building. I think your organization is a little different than the Commonwealth. I think you have a a really uh, proven track record. I guess my question would be in term, two, two questions. In terms of the historic value mm -hmm. of that building, um, I mean, Thomas Edison lit up Green Street. I, I would suspect that there's some components within that building itself um, that has some historical tax credits, historic commission of the state would be involved. Um, but but I, do, I do think that we need to leverage you're saying right now that it's probably not even worth 100 grand because of the condition it's in, but you know we're already having snow. It's already been kind of lousy, so I think we would want to shore that up. Sure. Um, ASAP. That's the first um, order of business. But I also think that Mr. Rodriguez actually ha had a lot of value in what he just said because I, I used to sell real estate years ago for Middleton Real Estate, and I think that it's short-sighted not to put an ad in the paper because it's short money. And you may get someone that just doesn't know you or the council. And, and at the end of the day, we want to get the most money, number one, and also the best possible business that can go there. You know, mm -hmm. and, and I don't know why it fell apart the, under Bell's Audio or under Carpenter. I suspect it was financing. Um, there might be title issues. I don't know if Attorney Nazarelli can opine on that. But, I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's a tax taking, right? Correct. So there's a certificate to the city. Right? Redemption's right. gonzo. Correct. So, so I guess if, if this comes to fruition and, and we convey this over to you, Robert, what's your expectation in terms of, of, of marketing? Like how quickly would you get on this? The first order of business is, as you said, to secure the facility. Uh, we do that now with a lot of our receivership properties, but to secure it, uh, to make sure that it doesn't deteriorate any further. Okay. 
You haven't put an ad in the enterprise in some time, I can tell, because you say a very I just put one in for a yard sale about six weeks ago. I made about 200 bucks. I did all right, huh? <laughs> How much did it cost you? <laughs> huh? you know? It cost you uh, 200 for the, for the kids, yeah. that's for sure. 200 bucks to put the ad in, <laughs> you know? Um, it, it, I think it's something we definitely will consider doing the marketing. I, I, I might have overstepped and said that, no, I wouldn't want to market it in the enterprise. But here's the thing. <laughs> I think... Once people know we have the building, and it's a totally separate process than going through the city and doing an RFP, right. they'll see it as an easier process. Right. Hmm. Um, coming in and negotiating with the BRA, understanding, just as Councilor made some very good points about making sure that the council knows what we're doing. As far as a, our, my board, I'm sure they'll, not only will I send out an invitation when this comes up on the agenda for discussion, should you go ahead and transfer it to the BRA, they would love and probably want and ask for your input into that discussion. Um, I think it's hard to say what the value is on this property at this time without doing a, 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 right. either a broker's price opinion or just getting an appraisal, right. a full-blown right. appraisal, which we will have to do as part of the BRA process. We will get a full-blown appraisal. That's part of the process once it's transferred to the BRA. Yeah, and in terms of the historic aspect, because I think that could be the hook. I think that's mm -hmm. really where we've seen a lot of businesses here, developers here in Brockton, benefiting for the city, but also for the tax credits because it's a financial win-win. Um, how, how do you, I mean, you'll target the, the, the proven commodity developers that already have a track record, but how do you branch off into potentially other developers with that historic aspect i think what we'll look for is their expertise in dealing with historic tax credit tax credit as you know it's a, it's almost like a two-year process yeah, it a is. 24 month process uh, once it's designated the but, but clearly this property has historic tax credit value uh, we mentioned the hardwood the tin ceilings it has a value there. So that'll probably be part of our criteria. And any smart developer who has capacity, who's done this before, will see that. Right. And that's going to be part of their performer, part of their criteria for coming in. It's going to be part of it. Thank you. Have a Merry Christmas. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Barnes. Thank you. Um, just really one more question about this kind of advertising and the method um, going forward. Are there any kind of, um, like, journals or construction, you know, parties that people belong to, kind of, kind of like if, if you're applying for a, a job in a law firm, there's like a particular place where all law students know to go to look for jobs or USA jobs. Or, is there something like that for developers and there construction? Is, there's a central register. There's trade magazines for construction. Okay. And we can advertise there. We Definitely can use our, okay, some of our marketing those. skills. Okay. Now, mind you, Councillor Rodriguez was focusing on local. Those usually focus on national mm -hmm. and even beyond you know, right, but I, I would assume that even some of the, the local, and I'm, I mean, I'm, I for this particular so. project, sure. I'm including, you know, like a Bridgewater or something as local as well, because I know some people, sure. developers South in Bridgewater, that, are, that might be interested. Okay, so get there is a, a wider net that can get the locals and the intro sure. locals, I guess. Okay, that's my, la my question really? on that. But um, really? something that you said, actually, so if I'm... To understand this correctly, so this is the property that's right across from the health center, right? Right across Green Street on the health center on the Former other side Green of the Times building. Correct. Green Same side. I mean, uh, behind it, I guess you yes, would say. So coming, of, coming south. Right. Right? That's it? Okay. So um, you mentioned something about, I guess, in the initial kind of brainstorming or whatever is going on, that housing may not be the best fit. How's that going to work for the people that are living in those condos there on, the, on that end? Which condos? The Times people. Because that, that front is like Times condos or something. And then the back is this. No, Counselor, they're two separate buildings. If you were looking at the Times building, it's mm -hmm. actually, it, I think it has a common wall, but it's actually but it's a building actually, to the left of that block. No, I understand. But with, I'm talking about the common wall. Mm -hmm. If I live there and then a mall is going to go behind my house, behind my bedroom, well, I'm going to have something to say about it. Uh, or, or retail space. I'm, I'm just saying, I, w I would just think that another kind of housing situation would go there. Um, it's, I don't want to discount it. Okay. But understand that on the first floor, there was small retail there anyway. Right, right. Okay. And there, there are some up the other side there. It, right. it, it, yeah, okay. All right. So um, I wouldn't discount it. I would just saying in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, are those people, I mean, of course they're going to be kind of notified or they're going to have some input all and all the that stuff? All the butters will be notified, absolutely. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. all right. 
Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Thank, thank you, Council. Councilor Rezek. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My question's been answered. Good evening, Mr. Jack. Good evening, Councilor. Thank you. Pop in whenever. Make, make a motion. Make a motion for favor. Recommendation. Second. Second. Like motion made and seconded to recommend favorably to the full city council. All those in favor? All those opposed? Recommended favorably to the full city council. Thank you. Item number five. Resolved to invite <coughs> representatives from the Catmobile, a low-cost spay neuter clinic currently providing services in the city to both pet owners and feral cat colonies to discuss further plans and opportunities to address this concern more thoroughly. Invited Tom Tichella, Supervisor of Animal Control and a representative from MRFRS headquarters. Council Beauregard. Yes, Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, this evening we have um, Mr. Uh, Tom DeChellis, the Supervisor of Animal Control, and he has worked closely with this organization, the Catmobile, and tonight we have Kerry Gig Leo, and we'll invite her up to the, this podium here. And uh, she is the program manager, and she came all the way down here from Salisbury, Massachusetts. Uh, she's going to provide us with some information on the current grant that's in this city, working on addressing the feral cat population, which unfortunately is huge. And uh, they've been quite successful in beginning to make, I'm going to call it a dent in this with a spay uh, trap neuter program that's used in many cities throughout this nation. And we have a couple of volunteers actually in the audience this evening that have been doing this. And um, for the residents and for businesses alike, this is uh, a huge concern. And uh, it's part of a quality of life. And for many people, you know, that have compassion for animals, it's also, a, you know, a humane concern. So I'm going to let uh, Kerry um, speak. And I don't know if sh you need to spell out your name for the clerk, if you don't mind. Thank you. Sure. It's Kerry, K E R R I, Gigliello, G I G L I E L L O. Um, thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Just, I'm not sure if you all are aware of what the Catmobile is, but like she said, it's a low-cost spay and neuter program that is affiliated with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The Catmobile program started in 2008, um, and since then we've actually spayed and neutered over about 50,000 cats. Mm -hmm. um, we travel as far south as Attleboro. We go as far west as Gardner, and as far north as Salisbury, where we're located. Um, in 2015, we applied for a grant who, for free, owned and free roaming feral cats through the PetSmart Charities, um, and we were approved for a total of $90,000 for the city of Brockton. Um, this was allocated to spay and neuter approximately 650 indoor owned cats and 850 roaming feral cats. <clears throat> um, we began to utilize this grant in December first of 2015. Um, to date, we've spayed or neutered 424 indoor cats and 653 free roaming feral cats. Um, 559 of those are females and 518 were males. We've had a lot of a help from different organizations, shelters, rescues, and independent trappers um, to help us with this project. Um, I'm not sure if you have any questions. Council Barnes. Uh, yes, thank you for coming. Um, I know someone that actually used the Catmobile to, to spay her cat, and it was a, a really, it was in, um, inexpensive and yep. efficient and uh, really a good help, so I do thank you for your, your service. Now, let me just ask a question. So of the feral cat colony, as it says here um, in the order, now, where I live, there are a lot of feral cats. A couple of them have even gotten into my basement in my house, and they've had kittens, and it was a disaster, actually. Mm -hmm. um, but there are also a few outdoor cats of some of my neighbors. And, um, you know, sometimes we feed them or whatever. But we can tell them apart because that's our neighborhood and we know these cats. So if you're, how do you guys know the difference between, do you just round up a bunch of cats? Like without, <laughs> how does that happen? Typically it's um, people will contact either us or local organizations about certain colonies um, that are having kittens that have been in the area. Um, what we do for feral cats when we release them, we, um, we tip their left ear. So then that way we know going forward that they are feral and they've already been spayed or neutered. Um, most of the cats that do come um, 
like I said, people are contacting because there are colonies. You can tell the difference between a stray or just an outdoor cat and a feral. A feral cat is a cat that you wouldn't be able to get near because it would try and kill you. So <laughs> a lot of times... They came in my house and had kittens. Yeah. See, uh, uh, but the problem um, also is people will just get rid of their cats and put them outside. So yes. in that instance, they aren't cool. truly feral. They're used to humans. Okay. And so okay. in that instance, they wouldn't be fearful. I see, I see, okay, mm -hmm. okay. And can I ask just one, one more question? Sure. Mm -hmm. Do you recommend feeding these cats when it's cold? Because I feel real bad. Yeah, um, we actually, on our website, we have mrfrs.org. There's some information about how to, um, how to help. care for them. Yep, okay. to feed them, and um, Charles, River, Charles River Alley Cats does a lot with feral cats as well. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Councilor Razak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Carrie. Thank Good you evening. for being here. Um, some of the statistics you gave, were those general? For, they weren't just Brockton, the numbers that you gave us, were they? The, um, as far as 50,000, no. <laughs> okay. um, but as far as the numbers, for the indoor and free roaming, those are particularly Brockton just for the grant that we received. The 424 and I believe 653? Yes. Oh, yep. So that is just Brockton, okay. Yep. Um, the other question I have for you is I know that, so if um, a resident calls and wants to have their cat um, spayed or neutered, mm -hmm. you do come down to that residence and take care of the we cat? Have, we actually have a calendar that we go to, we go to up to 30 different locations. Mm -hmm. Um, we park at the Westgate Mall at the Pet Supplies Plus. Yes. Um, it's like a 33-foot truck. I've seen um, it there. I'm actually, that's yeah. my ward, so I've seen the truck there, which is really great. Yeah, so we don't go to actual people's residences. Mm -hmm. We park in certain locations, and then they come to and us. And they bring their animals yes. there. Um, now, is there a fee, or is that covered in the grant? For the grant, um, for owned cats, it's $20, oh, yeah. and that includes a spay, neuter, Yes. Rabies, a distemper, a nail trim, and a brief nail trim and a brief exam. Um, and for ferals or free roaming, it's free. Very good. Now you said you tip the um, ears of the cats that you um, that are in the that are feral. I've yeah, for the f true feral cats that we trap and neuter and release, those will get ear tipped. So what is that exactly? Is it's that just it's a small part of the top of their ear, so it's a marker to know whether or not. So the it cats just mark. Okay. Yep. Um, now, are you keeping? Does the company keep st statistics to see if um, if we're taking care of the problem, if the numbers are getting smaller. Is there any statistics that are kept is the question? We don't have any right now. Um, I'd say moving forward, the, that data would come through just by what we've done so far. But as far as immediate right now, we don't. So as far as the grant goes, you don't have to show any, you don't have to prove that it's kind of like working or how, what numbers, are, the cats that you're taking no, care of? No, because right now it's kind of, it's too soon to tell. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. Anyone else? Uh, Council Borey, I guess you can finish up. I yeah. have to tell you that was very informational because I thought the Catmobile was Catwoman's car, but... Uh, <laughs> no, that's a Batmobile. <laughs> that's a Batman's car. Well, here she was. Now, first of all, I want I want to thank Kerry for coming up here this e this evening. I again, she mentioned it's and this is from Merrimack, you know, in Salisbury that they they're going throughout the state, and this has been huge. And again, Tom um, DeCellis, uh, sitting back there, he did reach out to me um, to work closely because they get the calls at the animal control homeless cats, homeless kittens, and the feral situation. The reason that we, we know that this is successful as far as the individuals that have been serviced, and $20 versus what you'd pay at a veterinarian, and this so many times is for seniors that you know have their pets and are on fixed incomes. Uh, those are some of the individuals serviced, and you know young families and other individuals with financial challenges. So the reason we wanted, first of all, Kerry to come up here is to, again, you know, as work closely with um, the um, animal control department as possible and work with the community and to look at more grants because this one will expire when exactly? Um, technically, it would expire the end of this month, but we're applying for an extension, which will most likely go three to six months out. 
Okay, and this is, this is also the information that we wanted to provide. And if those of you have taken the elevator in this building, you see the flyer, Carrie has them, and she has them available. And people just take the little um, piece of it, have the phone number, make the arrangements. And uh, we're particularly concerned we wanted this to come up because, of course, this is the colder time of year in the winter. And so many people are feeding these feral cats. And uh, they mean well, but this is part, part of the solution it, and this is solution driven to address this and because it affects so many residents and businesses in this community. So I want to thank Kerry for coming and Tom DeCellis for um, being over here and available. And uh, I'd like to uh, move to um, have this uh, resolve filed favorably Second. to a full city Second. council. Motion made and seconded to recommend favorably to the full city council. All those in favor? All those opposed? Recommended favorably. Thank, thank you, you very much, uh, Ms. Gugli Gigliello. Let it go. I let it go. Thank you. Uh, Councilors, uh, just a reminder that this will be our last finance meeting of this year. I'd like to thank our two clerks very much for a good year. Uh, we will be meeting next Tuesday night, the 27th, as full council, where we will also caucus to elect a new uh, president for next year. Uh, so uh, we'll see you next week. Merry Christmas, Christmas. Happy, yep. joyous Kwanzaa, and happy Hanukkah to everybody. And if I missed any religions, enjoy your <laughs> holiday too. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.